Good evening, folks, and welcome to our evening commemorating Operation Entebbe, the unheard insider story. I'm Shayla Furlong, Director, Central Texas for Jewish National Fund. I'm thrilled to join the Jewish community here in Austin and to be here with you tonight as we share an amazing story of courage, hope, resilience, and connection. Tonight's remarkable program is put on by Jewish National Fund in Austin, and we have hundreds of Jewish National Fund USA supporters turning in, tuning in virtually from all over the country. Since 1901, Jewish National Fund USA has been your voice in Israel. We started with collecting change from across the diaspora to buy the land of Israel. Once we achieved statehood, we turned to planting trees and making the desert bloom to create an inhabitable homeland. Today, our work is varied in scope, but singular in benefit. Every dollar we raise, every project or initiative we take on, every partner in Israel we support aligns with our vision of ensuring a strong, secure, and prosperous future for Israel. As we support the growth and movement of Israel's population to the north and south, building infrastructure and critical community services along the way, we also support Israelis in a variety of areas. In the last year and a half, Jewish National Fund USA has stayed true to our mission in spite of the challenges provided by the global pandemic. We have supported 60,000 Israelis with special needs and disabilities, including sending laptops to hundreds of children to ensure they could continue to receive therapy online while sheltering in place. We answered the call during the recent escalation with Gaza, sending imperative firefighting equipment to put out the blazes lit in the south by incendiary balloons and rebuilding the Western Galilee Tourist, Tourist Information Center after it was desecrated by rioters. We flew almost 7,000 people to Israel for virtual tours, connecting American Jewry to Israel during isolation and boosting the tourism and trade industry, which suffered as international travel screeched to a halt. We protected and maintained 200 heritage sites. We continued to support Israel as the global leader of water solutions. And we touched over 20,000 students with our Israel Continuum programming. This is the critical work of Jewish National Fund. Tonight's program is an inspiring one. In a time where anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are raging across the globe, and in a time when anti-Israel sentiment is at the forefront of Middle Eastern news coverage, the story of Entebbe reminds us of the little nation that could. It reminds us of our dream to return to the Jewish homeland, and it reminds us of a time that the world rooted for Israel. Today, we reclaim that narrative. Today, we remember Israel's might. Today, we bring you a positive story of Israel you should be proud to share with your family and friends. This positively Israel message is at the core of Jewish National Fund USA's values. It is our responsibility not just to support the state of Israel with our financial contributions, but also with the education we give and the stories that we tell. It is in that spirit that we offer this unique and exciting 45th commemoration event for Operation Thunderbolt. We hope you're inspired by this incredible story, the connection between our speakers, and the intrinsic bonds that tie all of us to Israel as the ancient and modern homeland of the Jewish people. Before we begin our program, I'd like to take a moment to thank our generous partners and our in-kind sponsors. Rabbi Neil Blumoff, Jennifer Rubin, and Congregation Aguda Sahim. thank you for hosting us this evening, donating your sanctuary space, and going above and beyond to help us bring this program to life. We'd also like to say a big thank you to Life Stories Alive for donation of time and talent, the Austin Jewish Film Festival and Dave Finkel for projection equipment, and Ginny Belosky of Ginny B Photography for capturing tonight's event. Finally, we politely request that you silence your cell phones now if you have yet to do so. Thank you for your partnership here so that we may uphold the integrity of this evening's event. With that, I would like to introduce you all to a very special man. This gentleman has made me feel truly welcome in Texas. He has devoted hours upon hours to Jewish National Fund USA in the support of the state of Israel. 
He tells the best and worst jokes that I may have ever heard. He is generous, infectiously positive, and he dedicates his life and work to preserving the personal history and legacies of families through his business, Life Stories Alive. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mike O'Krent, Jewish National Fund USA Southwest board member, Austin documentarian and filmmaker, and the director and moderator of tonight's event. Mike, take it away. Thank you, Sheila. The best and the worst, huh? Yep. <laughs> She's right. <laughs> For your information, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> The three of us on stage this morning were tested for the COVID and all of us tested negative. And that is the reason why we don't have a mask on. On Sunday, June the 27th, 1976, <clears throat> Air France flight 139 took off from Tel Aviv, Israel, carrying 246 mainly Jewish and Israeli passengers and a crew of 12 bound for Paris. Two of the passengers on that flight were Yehuda and Rivka Gottlieb, parents of Esther Smith. It is my pleasure to introduce and welcome Esther Smith. Welcome, Esther. Thank you. Esther, at that time, where were you and your husband, Larry, living? So we were in Boston. Okay. Um, and well, outside of Boston, in Lexington, in Belmont, actually, I came as a foreign student to the United States in 1970. I got my PhD. I met my husband. He got his PhD. And we had moved to Boston, a city where he was born. What was the purpose of your parents' travel that day? So they came especially to attend the birthday party, the second birthday party of our, grand, of our daughter, their granddaughter. Your daughter's name? Healy. And her birthday is on July 7th. So they were to arrive on what date? Uh, they were ar to arrive on June 28th. Where were each of your parents born and raised? So uh, my father, he was raised, he was born and raised in Russia um, in an area that sometimes was Poland, sometimes was Russia, sometimes was the Ukraine. And my, and my mother originally is from Poland, but she also had lived in Germany. And during World War II, she was in Auschwitz and my father, mm -hmm. and my father was a soldier in the Red Army. He was a soldier in the Red Army during World War II, correct? Right, yeah. And he you, you, ended up in Germany, uh, and he decided that he wasn't going to go back to Russia. He spoke German fluently, so he took off his uniform, and he melted into the population. You were born in Munich, Germany. Right. When did your parents move to Israel, and where specifically in Israel did you grow up? So I was born after the war in Munich, and, uh, and my father grew up in a Zionist family. They even spoke Hebrew at, in his home, and he wanted to go to Israel. Um, so two months after the end of the War of Independence, he decided that we, we should all go to Israel, and that's what we did. Also with us this evening is Gadi Ilan. Welcome, Gadi. Gadi, where were you born and raised? I was born in Israel, raised in Israel. What city in Israel? Ramat Gan. Like most all Israelis, both men and women, at age 18, you began your service in the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF. Did your mother or father serve in the military as well? Well, my father, my father, was born in Vienna, raised in Vienna, ran away from the Nazis at the age of 17, managed to get to Israel, joined the British army under the Jewish brigade, went back to Europe for the Nazis, came back, joined the Haganah, which was the underground, for the British out, joined the IDF for the first independence war. So yeah, he had some, some history also on his own. The military experience. Was he proud of you when you joined the IDF? I am, well, first of all, everybody joined, or most people joined the IDF. He was proud of me. I believe so. Um, 
yeah, especially I think he was proud where I joined there. So yeah, here's my father and me in the early uh, days picture. Describe briefly your basic training in the IDF. So I joined the IDF um, actually, okay, let's take it a little bit back because uh, at, at the age of 17, when I was in my last year in the high school, somebody came to me, a guy I knew from the scouts and says, do you want to go to test for the Sayeret, Sayeret Matkal? And I said, uh, wow, I didn't know you are there. Yeah, sure, I will go. So I went and tested and uh, managed to get through. And he's going too, too, too fast for the slides. <laughs> oh. But so I joined the, the uh, unit at the age of 18. And the training is a long, long training, uh, over a year and a half. Uh, of hard things and the all kind of things that you train in uh, special units. And um, some of the pictures are here. Uh, One of the pictures that was taken was on Masada, correct? So this picture right there is on Masada. It's, uh, this picture is very significant because it has a few things that are significant. And it's, first of all, it's the end of a certain stage in our training, which is very crucial and very important. After uh, a long, a few days of very hard exercise, we are here at the end on the top of Masada. Behind us burning is the symbol of the unit that uh, I think you will show later. And, um, um, but what else is very significant here are the people that next to me, uh, the guy that is on my left, his name is uh, Itamar Ben David. Two months later, he will die in a, another rescue, hostage rescue operation called Savoy, which was in Tel Aviv. And uh, the guy that is on my right is my good friend, Shlomi Reisman. Uh, he's in the many pictures with me from Entebbe. In the same operation in Savoy, he got injured, got a bullet in the hand and survived a few months, he got back. So this picture is very significant. What was the name of the special unit that you were assigned to? It's called Sayarat Matkal. It's Sayar, Sayarat Matkal. Is there a unit in the United States uh, military forces that is equivalent or can be compared to Sayarat Matkal? I know y'all were better than any of them, right? Sorry? <laughs> no, I haven't been in any of them. And I mean, I don't know exactly some people. I know what is written in Google. So <laughs> you, have, you probably know it too. But, um, Sayur, so. Sayuret Makal has been compared to either the Navy SEALs or the Army's Delta Force. These are tough guys. Tell us about the training of that specific unit. Well, by the way, um, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> and I quote, first and foremost, a field intelligence gathering unit conducting deep reconnaissance behind enemy lines to obtain strategic intelligence. So, Sariyat Makal is also tasked with counterterrorism and hostage rescue beyond Israeli's border, Israel's borders. When you were asked to serve in that unit, how many soldiers were selected for the initial training? Um, we were about 16. How many made it out of the training? 12. Air France Flight 139 made its scheduled stop in Athens, Greece, picking up an additional 58 passengers. Less than eight minutes after it lifted off from Athens, four passengers who had just boarded the flight in Athens, two from the Popular Front of the Liberation of Palestine and two from Germany's Bader Meinhof gang, seized control of the airplane. The hijacked plane stopped in Benghazi, Libya. Then the plane and by the way, more um, terrorists boarded in Benghazi. Then the plane was ordered to fly to Entebbe, Uganda, some 3,500 miles to the south. The passengers were held hostage at an old abandoned terminal at the airport. This was the first time ever that Israelis were taken hostage by terrorists outside of Israel. The terrorists issued their demands. In addition to a ransom of 5 million US dollars for the release of the airplane, 
They demanded the release of 53 Palestinian and pro-Palestinian militants, 40 of whom were prisoners in Israel. They threatened that if these demands were not met, they would kill the hostages beginning July 1st. Gadi, you shared with us an original note given to Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. What does that note say? I think you have it underneath you. I have it in my pocket, but I know what it says. It says, thus connection. Okay, I'll take it from here. So this is the original note, I guess, that Rabin got uh, when he lost connection with uh, Air France flight that had many uh, Israelis on board. The plane was on his way from Athens to Paris. And then the name of the secretary of Rabin back then and the date, which is 27-6-76. He was going about his regular prime minister business and he gets this note. Esther, take us back to this place, please. You and Larry are at the gate at the Boston airport. As passengers enter the terminal from the flight that your parents were scheduled to be on, the flight from Paris to Boston, briefly describe what happened. So on the way to the Boston airport, we heard the report of an Air France airline being hijacked. And I remember saying, oh, these poor people uh, at the airport, the flight arrived and the passengers came off the plane and I didn't see my parents. So I went to the Air France agent and told him that I was expecting my parents to be on that flight and can he please find out why they have not come. Uh, in those days, 45 years ago, you had to send a telegram. So he sent a telegram to Paris and he told me it will take about 20 minutes and he will find out. So after 20 minutes or 30 minutes, uh, he told me that my parents had missed, had missed the connecting flight from Paris to Boston. And, and they are coming on Monday and he gave me the flight number and the time. So we went home and, and I knew from experience uh, that friends had a terrible phone system. So I did expect my father to call, but we did not receive a call from him. And I thought, oh, probably because of the phone system, it couldn't get through. So on Monday morning, I went to my office and Larry went to his lab and he came to pick me up. We, we only had one car and he came to pick me up in the afternoon and we drove to the airport and the flight arrived and no parents. So I told, I said, oh my gosh, maybe they were hijacked, you know, as a joke, that was a bad joke, right? <laughs> so I went back to the same agent and I told him, I said, and I said, remember me? <laughs> where are my parents? He said, I don't know. I said, well, can you find out? So he said, again, he's going to send a telegram to Paris and it may take a while. So I went back to my office. I worked for a consulting firm and we also had an office in Washington. And the person who was our head of the office in Washington just happened to call me on some project. And I told him the story. And I said, you know, I think maybe my parents you know, they were hijacked. And he said, wait a minute, my best friend is Senator McGovern. And he was at the time the head of the Senate Subcommittee on International Relations and the Middle East. So he said, I'll call him and he may have the information. So indeed, after five minutes, he, he calls me back and he said, yes, your parents have been hijacked. And that is how I found out after a day and a half that they were hijacked. So how many days after a day and a half? So you waited that full day and a half. Right. How did you feel? What went through your mind when you first heard that your parents were hijacked? Well, I kind of semi expected it, but I was rather shocked. Uh, and I just I want to add that um, I went, I went home, it was at the end of the work day, and I got a call from Air France, from that agent confirming that indeed my parents uh, have been hijacked. Gadi, how did you first hear the news about the hijack? Well, I was home and they gave us, uh, we were toward the end of our service. They gave us a few weeks to get used to civilian life. So they sent us home. 
and uh, we grew hair first of all and just um, waited so when the hijack happened we got a call from the unit don't go anywhere stay home wait for if something going on and that was from sunday i think the hijacking until thursday when we were called in i was just waiting home how did the citizens of israel react to the news of the hijacking so this hijacking was very unique uh, um, Israel knew quite a numerous of uh, hostage situations before. Like I said, we, we participated in two of them, uh, Mardot and Savoy, and there were others, including Sabena airplane. And but that was the first time that something happened outside, something like this happened outside of the state of Israel and so far away. So everybody felt really helpless. There's nothing, nobody thought you can do anything. This is 4,000 miles away, seven hours flight. So the, the mood in Israel was very desperate, very uh, bad. Did you think that as well? Well, I didn't think we can do something like what we did. Mm -hmm. And all kinds of thoughts came to my mind, but uh, nothing like flying there and trying to get them out. That wasn't, so when, yeah. As you drove to the base yeah. for this mission, you had no idea that this was exactly the mission that you were going to be on, but did anything go through your mind about past missions? You mentioned Hotel Savoy. Yeah, that, that, that's at that point, no, because we didn't know going later when we were ready. Of course, the Savoy and my lot was very much in our mind because in Savoy, for example, yeah. I'm going to interrupt. Briefly describe what happened at Malo, very briefly. So my lot was the first hostage situation when uh, terrorists took, uh, they took a whole uh, school with over 100 children, they got them in the third floor on a, in a class, in one class. And we were called in. There was no training by then on counterterrorism. There was um, no methods. And we just broke in to the building and it was a massacre. I mean, they just blew grenades and, 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 and um, shot everything. And we entered the class and after we killed the, finally the terrorists, None of the kids can move. There were 25 dead kids and uh, um, I think about 50 or other injured. Uh, so that was the beginning of, okay, we need to develop. After then Savoy was another uh, instance and in Savoy also was not a very successful one. Um, the only way in was through the stairs. They blew the upper floor, fell on us. Um, we rescued some of the hostages, some died between the, their shots and ours, I guess. And, um, um, but, we, but another thing that is significant is that the policy in Israel and the mood in the Israeli public back then is that we don't negotiate with terrorists, right. no matter what, and we don't surround to their demands. And right. here is a big difference also, right. what happened get, here. Okay, We're going to get there, but uh, thank you for mentioning that. When you arrived on base, what did the IDF uh, officers tell you about the mission? There's not the IDF officers, my unit officers. Excuse me. And we were gathered for briefing, first briefing in the briefing hall. And here comes the plan. We are flying to Entebbe. And everybody was like, what? Wow, okay. And another thing that's very significant here. Um, and the hostage took place on Sunday until Tuesday. There was no actually any initiation to start something because there were, most of the passengers had different passports, not Israeli friends and Italy and others, and they were Jewish and Israelis, but they have other passports also. And the Israeli government was sure that the international community will deal with it. On Tuesday, Rabin realized, Rabin, the prime minister, realized we are alone here, knock on the table, hey, we need to make a plan. Right. The leaders of the planning mission were IDF Chief of Staff Mota Gur, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, and Defense Secretary Shimon Peres. Who was the leader of the 20-man assault unit? So I, I just want to touch on that, really, because I think those are the heroes of the whole thing. It's Rabin and Peres. Rabin was the Prime Minister, Peres was the... I mean, to take such a dire decision to make an operation like this, this is a, a huge, a huge thing. And um, 
Mota Gur is sitting on the right of Rabin. Uh, when he first entered this government meeting on Tuesday, the Rabin asked him, uh, that's according to the stories after then, yeah? Rabin asked him, does the IDF has a plan? And Mota Gur says, yes, sir, we do. And Rabin says, okay, tomorrow morning, that's for Wednesday morning, I wanna see the plan at seven o'clock in AM. And Mota Gur went out and called his second in command that they were gathering already in the central uh, uh, army and says, I just told the prime minister, we have a plan, now we have to find one. <laughs> so when he came back, the story goes that the, the second, uh, uh, um, Kuti Adam back then, took him to a globe and says, when you told Rabin, we can, we have a plan. Did you know where Uganda is? And he said, Rabin didn't have any mood for joke. Uh, Motago didn't have any mood for joke. Who was the leader on the ground of the mission? Well, the leader was, the, on the ground, the, the overall leader was Dan from Ron, but the leader of our force that actually went in, which counted 33 soldiers, was Yoni Netanyahu, uh, Jonathan Netanyahu. He's the younger brother of um, Benjamin Netanyahu, who was the prime minister until now. And he was the leader of the, the commander of our unit did back you, then. Did you know him personally before? Well, I knew personally, which means, I mean, he came in a few months earlier and personally from the encounters on the daily basis almost yeah. yeah so that's to the amount that i that, to the extent that i know him a soldier from his big commander i mean but within the small unit right and remind us all how old are you at this time 20 20 oh no 21 so 21 on tuesday june the 29th after ugandan soldiers had opened an entrance to a room next to a crowded waiting hall by destroying a separating wall, the hijackers separated the Israelis, including those who held dual citizenship from the other hostages and told them to move to the adjoining room. On Wednesday, June 30th, the hijackers released 48 hostages. These were picked out from among the non-Israeli group, mainly elderly and sick passengers and mothers with children. 47 of them were flown by a chartered Air France Boeing 747 out of Uganda to Paris, France. The pilot, Michel Bacos, and a crew of Air France Flight 139 were allowed, they were given permission to leave. They refused. They were going to stay with the hostages. That's bravery. Esther, your mother was not the only Holocaust survivor among the hostages. Did she ever mention her feelings during the Nazi-like selection that took place in Entebbe? So she, uh, yeah, absolutely. She said it was the worst moment of the whole ordeal. And my mother was a tough lady. And she said she had a number of her arm on her, on her arm. And she said that when they separated the Jews and Israelis from the others, it was done it was done by the German terrorists. Mm. And having a German woman, uh, you know, um, heading and managing uh, this separation process reminded her um, about Auschwitz. During that long siege, your father scribbled onto some pieces of paper, a diary, a daily account of what happened. When did he tell you about that diary and when did you gain possession of it? Okay, so first of all, I have to correct you. Uh -oh. He didn't scribble. My father had wonderful handwriting and he was a very talented storyteller. I always said he was a master storyteller. So what he told me when I saw him after Antebi is that out of sheer boredom, he decided, to write a diary um, and he had some some pages and as the days progressed he was afraid he didn't know how long you know they will remain as hostages and as the days progressed he was afraid that he will run out of paper so his handwriting has become smaller and smaller and smaller and then i tried to read it i and i'm not exaggerating i had to have a magnifying glass and not only this, but each of these pages has no margin. It's from the very top 
the very sides and the very bottom. These hostages were in a room with nothing to do for all of these days. So boredom makes sense. How many languages did he write in his diary? <laughs> so in this diary, he started out for some reason in Polish and he wrote about 12 pages in Polish. And then for some reason, I never asked him, I should have, uh, he changed and he wrote in a mixture. It was mostly German, but some Jewish and from time to time Hebrew words written in uh, English alphabet. And those were the most challenging to actually translate <laughs> because I didn't expect, but it was a mixture of German, Hebrew, a bit of Hebrew and a bit of, of Jewish, but, but this was how he would write to me. So I'm very accustomed to, you know, uh, reading his stuff. What does that diary mean to you? Well, that is really a good question. Uh, in retrospect, it's really, it's really a, a historical document. We are aware only of one other person who wrote a diary. Um, when, he, when he came back from Antebi and a month after that, they did come to Boston. He told me about the diary and he said he was going to write a book. And um, over the years, he told me that he actually he took, he, he took the diary and he, he wrote a manuscript. Um, but after he passed away, I brought the diary and the manuscript here. And it sat in a drawer for 40 some years. Why? My daughter is a psychiatrist and she couldn't explain that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I, I just could not bring myself. So when did you finally bring yourself to read okay. it? So I really couldn't bring myself to even open it. I knew I put it in a drawer, so at least I knew where it was. And my son was after me for years, you know, asking me to uh, translate the diary. And I kept saying, oh yes, oh yes, I will, I will, I will. And he said, okay, I, if you give it to me, I will hire a translator and he'll translate it. I said, no, I don't want anybody else to read it. I want to be the first one to read it, but I didn't even open it. Yeah. And my husband was also complaining and he gave up. So a couple of years ago, uh, we met in Israel, another soldier who was in the rescue force and he was, he was shot by a, a Ugandan soldier and gravely uh, injured. He became a quadriplegic. And we went and spent half a day with him. And I told him about, about, about the diary. And he said, you must translate it. And I promised him. I also had some communications with uh, another uh, a Mossad, person who uh, is considered, at least he's considering himself as the Israeli expert on Antebi and on Eichmann. And he was the one who organized actually a big Antebi exhibit. Sure. Uh, he was complaining that Antebi had very few artifacts it, because during the rescue it was in the middle of the night and the people and the, and the hostages only had clothes that they wore and some handbags, and that was it. Yes. If, if, if I may interrupt, I'm sorry. Certainly, I'm sorry if I'm going on too long. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> yeah. very interesting. <laughs> For your enjoyment, ladies and gentlemen, who are here at this event, uh, Esther and, and her husband, Larry, will have at the reception the original document if you want to take a look at it in those little scribbled pages. Gadi, at that time, the Entebbe airport had two terminals, an old one and a new one. Who built that old terminal? So this comes to the issue of intelligence. So most operations start with intelligence. And when you gather intelligence, you know what you need to do. Sometimes operation has to wait maybe months or years to a piece of intelligence to come. This one has no intelligence. So they start gathering 
turned out an Israeli company, Solel Bonet, built this terminal. So dust went off some old archive, archive um, pro, um, um, architect blueprints. Yes, yes, and we got them. And based on them, in an airport field, abandoned airport field, we built a makeshift from, I don't know even how you say it in English, angle, iron angle, and some other things so, of the terminal. So you could rehearse the rescue. They built a replica. Uh, uh, it's not a replica. It's very, I mean, it's basically <laughs> you put, a, okay, put an iron angle here, an iron angle here, put a, and, and present here, this is the entrance. And then the next one, this was the makeshift. And that's one piece of intelligence, very important because that's how we, we know where to go. Sec a mission like this, to train properly for a mission like this, takes a while. How many days did you have to train for this? We mission? had two days. I mean, we came on Thursday. We started on Thursday evening. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we flew already. This, this whole thing, I mean, the, the, the significance of this operation is the timeline and what you had to achieve in that short timeline and decision to make, you have no time. And the only reason we all even have this one is because on Tuesday, when was the first um, ultimatum, right. uh, the Israeli right. government actually agreed to negotiate with the terrorists for the very first, okay, it's coming. But I want to say, I want to just refer to another the selection area. Uh, when the selection thing, when they send the Europeans back, you're coming to it, or I no, can no, talk about ahead, it. <laughs> that gave the Israelis uh, another opportunity for intelligence, mm -hmm. and agents were sent. Yeah. Uh, Mossad agents were sent. Uh, not, uh, our unit uh, agents, oh, really? mostly, yeah. And, uh, and also the Mossad. To Paris. So the released hostages went to Paris. Immediately, <clears throat> Israel sent people to Paris. Yes, to interview them and understand the routine, learn whatever they could on the routine and who, who is where, how many. And as the information come, it fed out to us. So, you know, more intelligence you gather, more you think you know what, what to do. So that's Just how the plan. Just within 48 hours, though. Everything was within 48 hours, yeah. As the final plan was being put into place, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin raised a concern about a potential barbed wire and other possible items, physical items at the airport that might physically obstruct the path of the mission. On Friday, July 2nd, a Mossad pilot with a small plane in Nairobi, Kenya took off on a supposed flight somewhere in Africa. He called in a distress signal over the Entebbe airport and requested to land in Entebbe, knowing he wouldn't be able to land. They said no. He continued to over and over and over again request, but as he was requesting, he was circling. Anybody, by the way, happened to have a camera. And that camera provided incredible intelligence to answer Prime Minister Rabin's concern. The story goes a bit further, and I don't know if it's true or not because I never saw this guy, but. <laughs> that he actually landed, actually. That's what Did we had on the 40th anniversary, that he actually landed and wow. surrounded by the soldiers, but he was a very charismatic guy. and said, what's going on? Hey, so they took him on a tour. That's the story. I don't know to confirm it, but... And then he said, you know what? Take me back to my airplane. And took him back. He did like this. I think I'm okay. I'm going to take off. And <laughs> set him and take off. Whether it's that true, but these pictures came from, yeah, from right. that flight. And they confirmed... Rabin said, according to the interviews after then also with El Barak, that um, um, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna approve it unless two conditions met. One is that from on the way that where, from where you land to the airport, there's no, um, any obstacles that cannot be passed. And second, that on the day of the operation, the hostages are still there yeah. where they are because there was a former US, rescue operation in Vietnam when was very brave, but the prisoners were not in the camp anymore. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I have read where almost on a daily basis, Idi Amin, the dictator from Uganda would visit and he would threaten to kill them. So they I, thought at any moment they were gonna die, correct? Well, almost correct. Yes. Um, it is documented pretty well in the diary. So Idi Amin would come once or twice a day and every time he had a different uh, wife and child, 
and and the uniform and he and his speeches to the hostages ranged from uh, very friendly and um, you know and fatherly um, style to raging and raving and yeah. and he really wanted the hostages to sign a letter or to write a letter to the Israeli government and sign it asking the government to relent and negotiate and release the prisoners <clears throat> as, the terrorists wanted. As that we continued, Esther, how were you receiving information about the hostage situation and from where were you getting the news? Okay, so I don't want you to think that I just drop names, but on Monday morning, um, we contacted our congressman and our congressman have, happened to be Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House. And his office was extremely helpful. They immediately contacted us with somebody in the State Department. And this gentleman, every day, about twice a day, or maybe sometimes three times a day, he would call me and give me information. At that time, uh, there was no American embassy in Uganda. So all the information came through the Swiss embassy. And it wasn't much. It was basically the information that I heard uh, on the on radio, or yeah. on television. And just a side note is I did call the Israeli consulate in Boston and asked them and, and told them who I was and asked them if they can give me some information. And they told me in a very stern way that they do not provide information to anybody. At any moment, did you think your parents would not survive? Oh yeah, every moment. Uh, as the week progressed and, and ultimatum after ultimatum uh, it came through, it became clearer that uh, it's not going to end well. It was the the hostages so far away um, in, in such a foreign country and by saturday i was pretty much depressed uh, the the last ultimatum uh it was set to expire on sunday morning so by saturday which it was july 3rd i thought that it's the end of my parents let me let me interrupt because we're going to get there certainly okay, okay. <clears throat> On Saturday, July 3rd, four C-130 Hercules cargo planes took off and went to Shamal Sek, right, first. The task force flew along the international flight path over the Red Sea, mostly flying at a height of no more than 100 feet to avoid radar detection by Egyptian, Sudanese, and Saudi Arabian forces. Two Boeing 707 jets flew uh, behind those planes. The first Boeing contained medical facilities that landed in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, not far from Entebbe. And the commander of the operation, General Yikutiel Adam, mm -hmm. was on board the second Boeing, which circled over Entebbe during the raid. Gotti briefly described that plane ride from when you took off to Shamrasek and then after. So the um, first leg was about an hour and a half flight to Shamrasek which was very bad because we flew a very low altitude and very low altitude advantage radars back then cannot detect you, but you cannot, it's so bumpy that most of the people threw up. And- um, Did you get it, sick? I didn't get sick much. I mean, I didn't feel good, but I don't throw up. So I didn't get really sick like others. There were others got really sick. One guy even had to drop because he felt that bad. Uh, after this ride. When we landed, we were all blue. And the, um, at that time, the government is still sitting. There's no permission to go. There's no green light yet. We took off from Sharon Sheikh, and the agreement was that halfway, if there's green light by the government, by then we continue. If there's no green light, we're going back. So we are taking off. <clears throat> me, halfway over, they could have pulled the plug on the whole mission. Yes, the government was sitting to take the final decision while we are in the air. That was the end over Ethiopia, I think, or somewhere there. Um, the green light came. 
What was your condition during the flight from Chamorosec to Entebbe? I slept all of it almost on the, <laughs> you slept the whole on, the, on, the, on the hood of the Mercedes. On the hood of a Mercedes. Yeah, so the issue of the Mercedes, should we get to it now? Or? What's that? On the issue of the Mercedes, why Mercedes we're and gonna, all that. We're going to get okay. to Okay. <laughs> um, what uniform were you wearing at that time? So we were given Uganda's uniform, which is, uh, I don't know how you call it, it's uh, camouflage, and um, which ours were not camouflage in Israel, but uh, we were given, and the whole idea was to try to, so the whole mission was built on surprise. Um, when the um, chief of uh, staff was asked by the government, in his opinion, what are the chances of the op operation? He said it's between zero and 100. So the closer the surprise will be complete, we are closer to 100. The less we are in the surprise, we are closing to the zero. So the part of that surprise, speaking of a Mercedes Benz, a black Mercedes, they found out the exact type of Mercedes that Idi Amin was driven in every time he visited. So He's not the exact type, Is the issue of, first of all, Idi Amin was out of the country back then. He went to some uh, conference. conference in Africa. So the idea was, and, and they, one of the part of the initial planning is people brought uh, pictures showing that when Idi Amin comes or um, officers come, they come with the Mercedes with the two jeeps behind them or convoy. So the idea was to try to uh, increase the element of surprise by making the, and beside the terrorists, by the way, there were about 300 Ugandan soldiers around the building at Idi Amin stationed there to, to guard them. So the idea was to um, make them try to think maybe it's Idi Amin coming in the middle of the night. So we brought a Mercedes, it had nothing resembled to it. It was an old Mercedes actually. And uh, I think, if I'm not wrong, it was white and we painted it black. Yeah. The idea was that we needed three rows of seats right. because we wanted to fit 10 people there. So um, they found some, again, within shorten time, they found the first Mercedes, they bought it, we painted it practicing it, and then two Land Rover Jeeps on the back. That was the force that went in. <clears throat> remember, ladies and gentlemen, all of this incredible planning happened in 48 hours. There is another note, by the way, that uh, is not here, but another note that uh, Perez write to Rabin, said there is an idea, uh, we may bring a Mercedes, so people will think uh, Idi Amin is coming back from the convention. And, uh, and I don't know, Perez writes in, in handwriting. I don't know if it's uh, applicable, but possible. Mm -hmm. So Rabin says, uh, right back and says, one, why Mercedes? Two, when does he come back? So. Esther, from your father's diary, mm -hmm. he indicated what happened that Friday night, Erev Shabbat, in the area where the hostages were being held. Would you please read what your father wrote in that diary that evening? So just a sentence or two of context, it is Friday and a large uh, percentage of the hostages are sick because of the contaminated food and water and everybody is extremely pessimistic. Um, my father has served as the chief cheerleader, is the eternal optimist. Um, and he felt it was duty to cheer everybody up and to ensure that they are still hopeful but it's Friday evening, it's Erev Shabbat on July 2nd, and the mood is very bleak. So he said, so later when Erev Shabbat started, two women came to me and asked for matches. And my father was a terrible smoker because many of us have not have any. I gave the matches to them and they went to the side and, and lit them and said blessings over them. No one had candles with them, of course not. Uh, they stood the, ma the matches up in the corner of, of the container and blessed over them as if, as if they were real candles. Uh, there were a number of religious hostages who put on trilim every day and stood along one side of the hall. And when Shabbat began, no one, 
among us smoked. We did not tell anybody not to smoke on Shabbat, but everyone understood that we do not have to tell people not to do so. Thank you. The terrorist original threat, as it was mentioned earlier, was that if their demands were not met, they would begin to kill hostages on Thursday, July 1st. Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Defense Minister Shimon Peres spent one week disagreeing on whether or not to give into these hijackers' demands to prevent more terrorism. Never before would they give in and negotiate with the terrorists. On July 1st, the deadline, the Israeli cabinet offered to negotiate with the hijackers to extend the deadline to Sunday, July 4th, to buy them the time they needed for the mission. Gadi four C-130 Hercules cargo planes landed at Entebbe at 11 p.m. The maps of the operation were carefully drawn and rehearsed. Briefly, if you will, describe what happened after you, that plane landed. Yours was the first plane to land. Yeah, we had the first plane. We, we, so in this plane, there was this Mercedes and two Land Rover Jeeps with 33 of us and a force of uh, parachuters that were, um, they had two roles. They jumped first. There was a, they were to put small fire on the runways for the other, we landed with full lights. They were there, although the plane could land with no lights, but for the other planes, they were putting lights and later the lights went off and they lit the plane. And also they secured the perimeter, they secured the new terminal. This is where the Soren Hershko, the guy that got injured badly, uh, he was in that force. They met uh, one Uganda soldier, he shot one shot and injured him that badly that inside his spine. And then, um, so we went off. So this is not a real picture. This is a picture from Mercedes coming yeah, back. Yeah. Back, right? Unfortunately, not like today when every soldier goes with a the camera, there was no pictures from the operation. A friend of mine actually took all these pictures, most of these pictures that we'll see from after, because he had a pocket camera in his uh, uh, pants, but he, was, uh, he didn't want to take it out, unfortunately, back then. But uh, we pulled out of the uh, airplane and started driving on the runway toward the airport, toward the terminal with full lights, the Mercedes and the two Land Rovers. Then on the, on, in the far front, we see two Uganda soldiers standing, one of them putting his Israeli yeah. weapon Uzi up and uh, doing like this with his feet and shouting something. Uh, at that point, we were quite close to the terminal, to the control tower. Uh, Yoni Netanyahu gave the order to shoot him. Uh, we shot him and, and the guys that sat, sat on the outskirts of the Mercedes on the, with the windows, they had pistols with the silencers. They shot them. They shot the Uganda soldier. Uh, he fell, by, or they fell. They didn't kill them. So an open fire was from the jeep. And then with, the, with the Uzis, it made a lot of noise after that, right? So the, the gun, the big gun from the Jeep made a lot of noise and that's when uh, the silence broke. So we stopped the car a little bit. Can you go back uh, one slide? Anyway, yeah. So we stopped the cars where you see actually a little bit closer to the control tower that you see there, disembarked the car, the Mercedes and started running. The force that went into the, um, into the building is us that went, from the Mercedes inside the building. And um, we had two entrances to enter, um, two teams into the main hall of the hostages. Uh, my commander and my colleague, Amir Offer, we, my uh, uh, team, my squad, that was Muki Betzer, the second in command, four of us, we tackled some fire from the left by Uganda soldiers. By the time we shot them, Offer, uh, Amnon and Offer, who were on the right of us, passed us, went first into the hall and killed the three terrorists that were there. But before that, Yoni Netanyahu. So immediately we started running, and Yoni Netanyahu's squad was in the middle, while the two of us, the two 
squads were around uh, on his left and right. He was in the middle. There was shots from the control tower, which we didn't know that somebody was there. There were shots from the control tower. He got a bullet that passed his heart, went from his chest, from the back, and uh, came out. So he, he goes, got, he goes, I'm sorry, he goes down yeah. immediately. Who's yeah. in charge at that point? In charge at that point is the second in command, which is Muki Betzer. It was, Where were you? In I, was, I was right behind him. Well, second behind him. There was one soldier behind him, and I'm second. We were four in this squad. So we ran uh, go into the building now, right? Into the building area. By then, the three uh, uh, terrorists that were there uh, were already shot by Amir, who shot them. Actually, ran. He saw um, his story. I mean, he, he says that he actually almost fell when he went to the Mercedes. When he got up, he thought everybody left him, so he started running like crazy to the building. My commander saw him, started running after him. As he ran, he saw the, the, the two German uh, terrorists that were in the entrance. They got up and they started shooting through the uh, glasses. The glasses broke. He saw the two of them. He showed them while running, killed two of them. As he entered the hall, my commander entered right after him and see another terrorist aiming his gun at Amir and kill him. And by that, we killed the terrorists. They're saying that maybe there's another terrorist inside, but by then we killed the terrorists and uh, um, we all went in and the scene was quite amazing. Can I tell you? Sure. Yeah. So um, imagine the hostages after one week and tomorrow is the deadline of the tomato. Is it? If, if I may interrupt, keep yeah. in mind it's it's eleven o'clock at night. Exactly, the that's what I'm saying. Asleep when all this started. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's eleven p.m. They're all asleep. They're all after one week of that ordeal, and all of a sudden they wake up to do, 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 boom. Do, 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 do. I mean, the noise of the because we were all shooting in the control tower and the Ugandis outside and 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 the, the and the first instinct I'm sure all of them was. That's it, we are dead. And all of a sudden, and they see many soldiers with Uganda soldiers, which they see around them all the time. And all of a sudden, this soldier speaks Hebrew. black face. No, we didn't black our no? face. That was a story. But uh, okay. uh, from, the, from, the fire, from the gunfire and everything, our faces look black. But, and then they hear Hebrew. And, and it was like. And what did you tell them in Hebrew? What was. What were when the first Hebrew? shouting was. Stay low, stay down. Tell us, is there any other terrorists here? Stay low, stay down. Don't get up. Any terrorists here? And that was the first. The whole thing took one minute. I mean, less than a minute, right. something like this. Again, we were afraid of explosive, and surprise was the main thing. So, and there was a 19-year-old hostage that stood up. There were there were three hostages that actually got killed in the exchange of fire in the crossfire. Yeah. But you tell a, a very tell us very quickly one hostage you said to them so directly the hostages when we so outside remember there's 300 ugandas outside most of them ran away but and there are some more terrorists there were eight terrorists all together there are only three in the building there are five outside four in the building there are four outside so while other forces our forces clearing up the building we are in the hall securing it and then we start preparing the hostages for going out. Yeah. So we're telling them, okay, you don't take anything. You just take yourself and go towards the, the entrance. And I tell one guy, put your shoes on and go toward the entrance. So he put the shoes on his hands and start going on his floor. I mean, the scenes were really surreal because- it, All of this happened like this. Yeah, by I mean, then- like The first part of what you described in, your, in this book, you said happened in two minutes. Yes. The running in and all of this that he just described happened. Boom, boom. Yes, boom. yes. It How happened very quickly. How in the quick. world do you know what to do at that time? Well, it's first of all, it's instincts, training, and, and you just take it as it comes. I mean, we knew what to expect. We expected much worse. Remember, there was a whole plane with medical, with the stretchers, with beds, and we were waiting for explosive, but surprise was good and it ended quickly. So you have to get so all of these hostages that were so then alive, get get onto the planes. After the whole thing was secured, uh, another force from Golani came with 
other jeeps that were in another airplane and started loading the passengers and driving them, the hostages, driving them to the plane. To the cargo planes. All yeah. seven hijackers there and between 33 and 45 Ugandan soldiers were killed. 11 Soviet MiG-17s and MiG-21 fighter planes from the Uganda Air Force were destroyed on the ground at Entebbe Airport. Out of the 106 hostages, as you mentioned, three were killed. One was left in Uganda, 74-year-old Dora Block, who was sick, who was taken to Entebbe Hospital, who was murdered the day after. And approximately 10 were wounded. The 102 rescued hostages were flown to Israel via Nairobi. They had to stop in Nairobi for refueling shortly after the raid. Describe your thoughts and your feelings when that plane took off from Entebbe. So it took 55 minutes from the moment we landed to the moment we first, to the moment we were last in the air. And uh, Yoni was still critically injured, not dead yet. He was pronounced dead in Kenya. We had to land in Kenya because the airplane did not have fuel. And that was another operation. I mean, to make it silently, secretly, that it will not leak and make the Kenyan announce them. You have 20 minutes for C-130 landing him. We need fuel. We don't, we don't take no for an answer. So that was another Mossad and all the uh, things operation. But what, the, feeling, the feeling was, was high. I mean, we knew the mission succeeded beyond, beyond what we expected, actually. So you take off from Nairobi, and what is the feeling after the, you take off from Nairobi? Well, we, I, I happened to sit some of the, uh, in the flight cockpit, some of the flight, and we hear uh, Uganda radio, the, and, and Idi, Idi Amin, who came back, uh, announced that his forces conquered back the airport and they are in control of the situation and we know what we left there. So it was a, a very, a very good feeling. Esther, when and how were you notified of the rescue in Entebbe? So I just want to mention one thing of the 10 who were wounded. Uh, one of them was my mother. She was, um, I guess she somehow stood up and um, and was injured with uh, sh uh, shrapnel from the grenades. So she actually, um, she was on in in Nairobi. She she was taken to the hospital and came back separately from my father in a different plane with all the injured. Um, so on Saturday, as I told you a few minutes ago, I was totally depressed. I mean. The, the, anguish, the anguish I experienced during the week was unbelievable. And I prepared myself, you know, for extremely bad news. So on Saturday, I went for a walk on the beach all by myself, and then I came back. And, um, and uh, we went to visit somebody and it was already at the end of the day. And as we were there, somebody called and said, you have to turn on uh, the, the, the television. There is a special report about a rescue of the, of the hostages in Antebi. But all the report said is that Israeli force had flown to Antebi and rescued the, the, the hostages and there were some casualties. How long did it take after that till you first heard from your parents? Oh. Uh, probably um, at least 12 hours. So <laughs> where did they call from? So <laughs> the reason it took so long is because my father who came back in a separate plane refused to call me until my mother also came back. He wanted to be sure you heard both voices. Right. So it was pretty hard to, to wait all this time. But uh, if he finally called on Sunday morning around 10 o'clock in the morning. What did your parents tell you when they first called you? So it was just my father. He said he was in the hospital with my mother and she is okay. And that was basically it, you know, but just hearing his voice was um, all, all that I needed. And this was on July 4th, you know, and July 4th since then has a special connotation to me. 
And in Boston, they had the oh yeah, the and it was during of this that's country, right two hundredth anniversary of this country. So there were right. the big tall ships in Boston Harbor, and all this was going on. Yeah, and you had other things on your mind, Gotti. There are many photographs of the safe arrival of the hostages in Israel. Did you personally experience any of that celebration at the airport? So this me there, by the way, on the right. There's one more picture. Maybe we'll show it later. Yeah. But uh, we experienced, I mean, first of all, Rabin and Perez came to congratulate us. Well, I, I, I'm going to interrupt, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. I want you to tell the story, but you were the first plane to arrive, but you were the last, um, well, in Entebbe, but you were the last plane to arrive. In, so in all of Israel. the things that all the people around the planes. We didn't, didn't see, see them anymore. Yeah. yeah. They landed in a, another place also. No, they landed in the same place, sorry. But you, we didn't see them. They're all gone by then. You shared with me a video that was taken at the arrival of the hostages. There's no sound on this video, but let's play this video if you would, please. Assuming the pilot taking off. Now, greeting the hostages um, the, By the, the way, they, you will see there's Shimon Perez and Yitzhak Rabin. Yeah. And they're about to come away from the back of that airplane. By the way, the Air Force and the pilots is another, I mean, they are the second in, in the honor right. to, to receive, to do this thing. Now, as these people come off, look at their expression. Some are shocked to see the prime minister there. Many are just thankful they're back in Israel. They're home. From here, they went to a bus that took them, I'm assuming, to the terminal. The video that Gotti shared with me is about 10 minutes long. We took short clips. This is the pilot of the Air France plane who stayed with the hostages the entire time. With the whole crew. And his crew. He died just this year. Yeah. And they honored him in Israel. They yeah, yeah they honored him. him. He became a... Here they are on the bus, and apparently they gave them some wine to celebrate. And they're all sharing. <laughs> they're all sharing. Their Actually, wine. it's a supper or liquor. There was no COVID going on at this time, right? Even if they give them Coca-Cola, I think they would share like that. Now we're going to stop the video in just a second. Esther? Yeah. Is that your father? I think so. Yeah. The bald headed man that we just passed. Right. She believes was her father. Continue the continue the video, please. Now we cut to the um, the Prime Minister and Shimon Peres greeting the soldiers who came off the bus. And there's many famous photos that you see of a Mercedes backing well for that. Now, the guy in the middle there, that's not you, got it, but that's exactly where you sat during the raid. I mean, during when you drove in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Three rows, you're back in the middle. In the middle and on the third row. Yeah. Continue the video, please. Where were you at this time? I don't remember where, I, how did I come off the plane? By the way, when it start going, you think it's me. In a minute, you'll see in the back seat, you think you can recognize me, but looking back, but it's not me. But uh, I don't remember where I was. In a minute, we're going to see the prime minister in Shimon Paris speaking to you to the soldiers. Forty five years ago they couldn't even put audio on the video. <laughs> While we what do you remember what Shimon Perez and Iskak were being told you that day? No, I don't remember exactly, but they just it was very brief here. This is it. We are sitting they basically say thank you. Um, I don't remember what exactly they said. 
Next time I remember. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll ask, I'll ask my friends. Go through the slides that, um, in the, is the people in Israel, let's quit the video and go to those other slides. The, the people in Israel obviously celebrated tremendously. There's many photographs. It was there. amazing. I mean, it was unbelievable what happened in Israel. I mean, we came to the base, there were about 40 women waiting with cakes and everybody knew that his ass did it. I mean, and then I went back home the same day what did your parents say when you arrived back home? So my mother and my grandmother, she was living with us. She woke up very early, five o'clock, and she hears something in the radio. There was no TV during the day. Uh, hears something in the radio, uh, something about, she goes, wake up my parents. So they say something about Antebe, and then they hear about it. But of course, I, everybody was very, very excited. We won Miss Universe. And a very famous uh, song con competition that year. So Israel was on the on the high rise back then. Esther, when did your parents finally arrive and complete their trip that they started yeah. on June, June the twenty seventh? So they came about a month after they came back to Israel. Describe your reunion with your parents briefly. Well, it was not that it wasn't remarkable. But what I wanted to tell you is the reason they came and it was quite a thing to go back on an airplane yeah. was that my father said that he could not he could not step out in israel without somebody stopping him and asking him questions and wanting him to tell all the all the stories and he said he got tired of it he decided he'll better come to the united states um, so they flew into uh, Kennedy Airport, and I actually flew from Boston to New York uh, to see them and to get them back uh, to Boston. And it was a very content kind of meeting. You know, when you're so happy, you don't even have to show it. You just, you know, everything is okay. And and actually, and actually, my father said when he came, he really doesn't want to talk about Antebi. <laughs> he did. He didn't want to talk about Antebi because he was sick and tired of talking about That's Antebi. So we did not ask him any questions. He did give a lecture at SUNY, um, State at, University of New York. Yeah, uh, our cousin was a professor there, and she invited him to give a lecture, and he gave. An hour and a half, like you know, he talked about Antebi and he charmed all the students. He was really a master storyteller, and and, and the story is fascinating. Uh, he did give a, a few interviews in the Boston area. I remember but, some of the articles, but other than that, we did not talk about Antebi. Unfortunately, there's so much more, and our time is our time is short. So I forgive me for interrupting, but Gotti, 45 years has passed since that week and. July of 1976. Have you had a reunion with your fellow Sariet? Uh, this is a picture from two weeks ago. We had a reunion and we actually paused. There is a similar picture when we did in the unit, mm -hmm. when we had a spot day, we were all very young and with our spot clothes and everything. So we did something, everybody positioned the same way that they were positioned there. I think we are still looking quite okay for being 65 and older, all of us, but yeah. It's a good looking group of guys, you know? I would say so, except the one that's sitting on the right, uh, lying on down <laughs> on the right, yeah. As you look back on your experience at Entebbe and all the other commandos and your brethren, how do you view yourself and your fellow soldiers? How do, we, sorry? How do you view yourself? How do you, what do you consider yourself? Some people will say you're a hero. How do you view yourself? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we, we were, I was lucky, uh, blessed to serve in the unit, to be raised like that. And also timing, you know, we, one month later we were out of it, another team would have done it. So I consider myself lucky, not a hero. And to be uh, after some of us did not survive also. So, yeah, but uh, yeah. just no one. Esther, mm -hmm. how do you consider those men? How do I consider them? What do you think of them? 
Well, um, a number, a couple of years ago, I spoke by phone the first time with Soren Hershko. He's the also the rescuer who was injured so gravely, and he happened to be in the United States. So I spoke, I, I spoke to him, and I thought it would be extremely awkward. But, and I, I told them, I thank you for saving my parents. Uh, and in my eyes, you are such a hero. And he said, I'm not a hero. I think that they briefed all of you to say I'm not a hero. I just did my job. And, and they Which is true. Back then, we didn't even think about it. This way. I mean, you know, but it is a story which is unbelievable. And it's 45 years after it happened, and well, it feels as if it just happened yesterday. On May the 26th of this year, just a few weeks ago, JNF here in Austin found out about the two of you in each of your stories. They had the two of you meet one another. Gotti, how long have you lived in Austin, Texas? Um, 20 years. You've lived, Esther, in Austin for 36 years. Have the two of you ever met before? No, I no. And we live I, one minute apart, but we didn't. You live like five minutes apart from me. One minute. One minute. <laughs> Gotti, at that meeting, you shared a story about, I think, getting a haircut because the pictures that showed you had pretty long hair. It was curly, it was long. You may have thought that was nice, but eventually you need a haircut, right? What there's, a, there's, there's another picture, I think, one more after that, that we showed the hair. But then. Um, um, so before no, so, yeah, he got, before he got the answers, I just want to say one thing. My father had. Oh, a, no, 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 don't say that. Don't say that. It. Okay, uh, never tell mind. Tell us the story, Gotti. Okay, never mind. Exactly as exactly as you told it at okay. her house when you first met on May the twenty sixth. No, so please. So if, I I never met the hostages only on two occasions. One is on the ten years anniversary. They did a reunion of all the hostages with us. So we all met together and mingled and everything. And the only one time I met a hostage was uh, when a friend of mine told me that he knows somebody who was a um, um, hostage and I went to meet him. And to make it short, uh, I, he cut my hair. And three weeks later, three weeks ago, I found out that, that what did you say? So he tells you this story about getting a haircut. What did you tell him? Well, we first, well, you know, every Israeli asks another Israeli, where did you live in Israel? So of course I asked Gadi and he said, Ramat Gan. And I said, oh, guess what? I also lived in Ramat Gan. Where did you live in Ramat Gan? And he tells me it was like, it was like two streets away from, from there in, in, my, in, in my Israel. house. And then I say, you know, there was another hostage, and I, I, he was, he had a hair saloon, and I went to cut my hair, and Esther said, that's my father. <laughs> yeah, and so that was a cheating moment, I mean. So, so, the moral of the story, one of the many morals of the story is, get to know your neighbors. <laughs> there might be a story and a connection that's 45 years in the making. Well, I would say yeah, it's, it's yeah. a never ending story. It is a never ending story. Esther, how do you thank Gotti for what he did and what his fellow soldiers did? And what I want you to do is look at him sure. and thank him. Well, I can tell you that I found a new friend and, it, and we became friends instantly. And of course, what can I say? You you have all my thanks and gratitude and forever. Thank Rabin and Paris. <laughs> Gadi, why is it important that people today know about Operation Entebbe? Well, I've thought about it. Why people would be interested in 45 years later on something like that? And I think um, I think actually Shaila, Shaila said it all in her speech before. And um, it was a moment of glory for Israel, uh, which we cherish. It was a legend, and we like legends. And especially in days like this, when the image of Israel is so low and you get bumped from everywhere, stories like this are important uh, to remind that there are also good things and good moments and um, a unity. Uh, so I think that's that was 
why this story still draw uh, yes. that attention. Why uh, is it important? Well, a key value in Judaism is Pidyon Shvu'im and Matir Asurim. Every morning, if you pray very early in the prayers, you say, thank you, God, who released, who released the imprisoned. And Tebi is the ultimate example of releasing hostages. Gadi, I understand that you are one of the featured interviews in a recently released book in Tebi Declassified, the untold firsthand story of the legendary rescue operation. This book, by yeah. the way, is available on Amazon now. So this book is uh, just released here in the US in July, available on Amazon, less than $20. And it's the collection of all the individual stories of almost everybody that participated, both the planners as the pilots. And it's quite interesting. And the reason I'm promoting this book is not only because I'm in it, I'm not gaining anything, but all the revenues of it, all the proceeds, 100% of them goes for good deed. Uh, we have an um, um, alumni association and uh, all of us that served in the unit and uh, we execute, uh, we do um, social uh, projects with teenagers and young adults. And we try to, in, in deprived areas, in the periphery areas, Mm -hmm. And we, uh, through the years, we touched the lives of thousands of young uh, children, young guys, and brought them up all the way to the army, and followed them beyond after to become a productive citizens and try to do a little bit better society. So, everybody, buy this book. In the worst case, you put it aside; it's good on a shelf. If you don't even read it, you did a good deed. <laughs> and if you read it and interested, maybe you buy another one, send to your friend. And your piece in this is very good. At the end of this, the authors, I'm assuming, write the following. Staff Sergeant Gadi Elan was drafted into the unit in 1973 to Team Anon Pelé. He worked in the hotel business after being discharged. Later on, many years ago, he was interviewed for a position in Africa. He was asked if he had any prior experience, experience working in the region, and he asked him, answered in the affirmative. He was asked, how long had you been in this region? And he replied, for a single hour. <laughs> Gotti, on behalf of the hostages that you saved, on behalf of the entire state of Israel and all of us, the entire world, thank you for that hour. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can imagine, there are so many details about this incredible story we have left out due to our time constraint of one hour that's now an hour and a half. Please wow. forgive us for not doing that. We have come to the conclusion of our program and we'll move to a question and answer period very shortly. But before we do that, I'd like to take a moment to humbly ask for your support. As a member of the JNF Southwest Board, I know this fact that Gadi and Esther meeting for the first time in this whole production tonight would not have happened without the Jewish National Fund USA. This event falls under the advocacy and education arm of our work. While JNF invests in programs like this to educate our constituents and spread positively Israel message, um, our organization is focused on raising funds to do great things for the land and the people of Israel. As a Southwest Region board member, I know the deep and lasting impact that JNF has, has left on all of our brothers and sisters in Israel. I've heard firsthand on how my contributions and your contributions will have uh, uh, and support a strong, secure and prosperous Israel. Whether it's building and, beautif and beautifying bomb shelters, are developing water solutions, agricultural technology, planting trees, protecting heritage sites, or ensuring the inclusion of all Israelis through our special needs and disabilities programs. JNF is committed to continuing our vital support of Israel. I hope you'll join me to support the Jewish National Fund by making a gift to our annual campaign in support of our work and critical work here and in Israel. 
We were there yesterday. We are there today, and we will be there in the future. Thanks to supporters like you. To make a gift, you can visit the link on the slide, jnf.org slash donate operation and Tebby. And for those of us joining in person, you can fill out pledge cards as I have done with the envelope that you receive. Upon arrival, drop them off at the registration desk on your way this evening. So we've allowed for a few minutes, a few minutes for Q&A, for questions and answers. There is a microphone and a special distance markers right in the middle of the sanctuary. If you have a question, please make your way to the microphone and line up and ask what's on your mind. Following the Q&A, please join us for a meet and greet in the reception in the, in the courtyard afterwards. If you have a question, please, please, no stories before the question. We don't have time for that. Just ask the question. Say it loud enough for all of us to hear and we will re repeat the question uh, for our online audience, which is quite big, thank God. Thank you guys very, very much. I am going to ask a question on behalf of our virtual audience this evening. I have a question that came in. Is Esther's book with her father's writings published? Well, I did translate the diary uh, into English and then I translated it into Hebrew. I'm almost done with the Hebrew translation and my plans are to publish it commercially. But not yet. Robert. Thank you so much for your stories. I was uh, struck by how, how little information was available. And my question is, in this time of social media, Esther, you, you had received very little information during that week. Uh, what would your life have been uh, like can you imagine what would have happened today with social media and, and so much information? And 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 Mr. Alon, same thing with you. How how would you pull off a uh, could the, the military pull off something like this today? No way. Immediately there will be on <laughs> online four uh, four C one thirty on the way to rescue the hostages before we before we even leave in Israel. So I don't think it's possible. I mean. If, if you... I don't know, but I don't think back then, yes, but not today. Um, I just want to add that in my father's diary, he, he, he repeats over and over again how all the hostages were completely cut off from any information. All the information they had came from Idi Amin, and they, and they did not trust him. So they had, not, they had hardly any information on what Israel was doing, actually. Um, any information how the world was reacting. It was just total silence. I would encourage all of you to not only buy the book because there's some great information about the book that you've never heard before, but dig in and find that information because when you realize how impossible this mission was, it should have never been successful. There was no way it was going to work by the thread. And by the way, there's a note from Perez. Uh, back then, yeah. writing to himself, he says, Perez was pushing for the operation all the time. And he says, everybody say it's not possible. Everybody say it's too far. Everybody say there's nothing we can do. And only all I can think, how is this operation going to end? That was in the beginning of the planning, you know. Go ahead. Okay, we have another question here that came from our virtual audience. Did the CIA provide any support or intelligence before the rescue? Did the U.S. No, CIA? Yes. That's what it's asking. Provide any intelligence? Not that I know. I think behind you there's a question. What? Yeah, this uh, is the final question. A, a few years ago, there was a Hollywood movie released about the, the, the hostage rescue. How realistic was that Hollywood depiction of the terrible movie? movie. Uh, we 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 were all so two of us were actually advisors to do this movie. We were all invited in Israel to the premiere. And when the movie was finished, we were all like shocked. I mean, the movie was totally like from the side of the terrorists, pretending them as humanitarian. I mean, it was in the spirit of today's more 
you know, atmosphere. So I think the movie was terrible and it was uh, rightly so very unsuccessful. So However, the two, the okay. two movies that were done after the okay. Antebe, the year, two years after were good, kind of. One Israeli, one with the Charles Bronson, Charles Bronson as Yoni Netanyahu. They were okay, but this last movie was terrible. But I just want to add one thing that I went to see that movie. Uh, and after, after it was over, I agree, it was a horrible movie. Uh, a, couple, a couple heard us uh, talking about it and they came and asked us if we have any relationship. And, and we asked them, who are you? And they said, we are from Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> By, by the way, a, a few years ago, some of my friends went to Uganda. Yeah, and they, to the, to the, and they met the son of Idi Amin. Oh, yeah. It was a very friendly meeting. And he says, my father did mistakes and uh, I acknowledge them. And he's a big guy like his father. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attendance this evening. Thanks as well go out to the local JNF staff, executive director of JNF Southwest, Reagan Weil, and Shayla Furlong, Director of JNF Central Texas. Shiloh? Well done on everything, really. It was not easy. No, no, no. No. Okay. Well, um, go ahead. It's not on, I don't think, so I'm just going to have to go ahead and project. So thank you, Mike, for directing and moderating our program this evening and for your time, your skill, and your expertise. Tonight's program would not have been possible without your vision and dream of bringing this incredible story to life. Thank you for sharing your talents with us and let's give Mike a round of applause. Of course, Esther and Gotti, thank you for your vulnerability and for sharing these intensely personal stories of Operation Entebbe with all of us and with our virtual audience. I think I speak for everyone here and everyone online when I say that I am deeply touched by your experiences, your bravery, and your undeniable connection. Thank you for your commitment to sharing your lives with us, the time you've put into this program, and for telling this never before heard behind the scenes insider story of the rescue from Entebbe. Please join me in showing our gratitude to Esther and Gotti. We did already. For a meet and greet with these two phenomenal, phenomenal people. Thank you all. Michael, thank you. You did a good job. You need to understand.